A very good evening, everyone. Um, as the director of Goethe Institute, Max Müller Bauern, I'm having again the great pleasure of welcoming all of you here present in our library as well as our virtual audiences to another literary intervention in the framework of State of Nature. State of Nature, which, as the name suggests, is based on ecology and climate change and ventures in its current third iteration since 2018 into multidisciplinary culture production and its associated conversations. I would like to mention that the related exhibition titled New Natures, A Terrible Beauty is Born is still on view in our gallery and on the natural history section and lawns of the CSMBS till next Friday. So if you are in Mumbai and you haven't seen the exhibition yet, make sure you pass by next week. It includes the works of 17 young and senior contemporary artists dealing with ecology from various perspectives. The exhibition is curated by Ravi Agarwal and the literature interventions by our curator of literature, Ranjit Hoskote. Today's lecture titled, It's Not Bad to be Wild, Willful and Peaceful, is by Niha Sinha. Niha is a conservation biologist and author. She heads conservation and policy at the Bombay Natural History Society. Her first book, Wild and Willful, explores the lives of 15 iconic Indian species. The book was semi finalist in the Siskiyou Prize for New Environmental Literatures, a global biennial prize. Niha is a noted columnist as well and contributed environmental commentary for the Hindu, the Hindustan Times, Bloomberg Quint, The Telegraph, and others. Dear Niha, I'm really happy to have you with us today virtually. Um, the floor here in the library as well as the virtual floor is yours now, and I wish all of you an enjoyable and interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great privilege to be able to talk about my book and some ideas about the citizens we share this country with, the wild and willful citizens, the non-humans. And in this talk today, I hope to throw open some ideas to all of you. And I hope that it's going to be an exchange of ideas rather than just me talking. And I'm going to start with a little presentation. So here is my central idea. My idea is that us as human beings, it's not so bad for us to be wild, willful, and peaceful. And I'm going to unpack all three of these words, wild, willful, and peaceful, as I give you this talk. When I say wild and willful, that is actually the name of my book. So wild and willful actually refers to animals that live with us. You know, some animals live in forests and in rivers, but very many of, of them actually live with us right where we are in cities and in the apartment complexes we live in. You know, in, in India, you have accounts of cobras in bathrooms and on trains, you have accounts of migratory birds nesting in the most unlikely of places um, in the middle and the heart of the city. And life in India really is a negotiation between the human and the non-human. And willful actually is usually seen as a negative term. And I want to examine whether being willful, that is having a mind of your own, especially for a non-human, whether that is a negative thing or whether we can see it as a positive thing. And finally, I do want to draw some ideas on what the wild can really teach us about being human or being more humane even as we go forward in life. So in this photograph are two of my favorite birds. It's a species known as the bar-headed goose, an incredible bird, one of the highest flying birds on earth. It actually flies over the Himalayas every year to come to India. And India actually is a very important stop for many migratory animals and birds, particularly for birds. We are the largest land mass right above the Indian Ocean. So a lot of these tired, long flying birds will actually stop in India to spend their entire winter. And these bar-headed geese I have photographed actually in the national capital in Delhi. 
And I want to start by us thinking about firstly, what is invisible to us? Uh, what are the animals or the wildlife or the landscapes that we don't actually see, even if they're right in front of our eyes? Uh, the second part of the talk will focus on what really is visible to us. Um, you know, things are a little bit more obvious to us as we go about our lives. And finally, I will reflect on being wild, willful, and ultimately peaceful. Let me start off by this amazing map made by my colleagues at the Bombay Natural History Society. So we actually capture birds and we bring them and satellite tag them to understand where these birds go. And when I say that we, we should think about what could be invisible to us, but actually is really there in front of us in our lives. Let me start with the curly sandpiper, which is a funny wading bird. Uh, if you see right in the middle of the map, that rough colored bird um, is actually a curly sandpiper. It was tagged in Maharashtra in Mumbai, where you are right now in 2019. And it was found to go all the way to China. And it goes to China and it comes back every year. So this is a bird that's both Chinese as well as Indian. It's, it's a bird of Mumbai. It's a, it's a bird of China. It's an international bird. And uh, many people would often be surprised to hear that a bird that makes such a long migration would choose to stop in a place either like Bombay or like Delhi, like the bar-headed keys I showed you. But of course, it's true when we say that birds and animals don't really know political boundaries and cities can actually be extremely important places for uh, the wild and willful amongst us and uh, when we think about the wild uh, life around us or nature around us often it is invisible to our eyes and the act of making the invisible visible is something i would like to touch upon this is a little extract from a book that I highly recommend. It's a book called Tales of Hazari Bagh, written by poet uh, Mihir Vatsa. And I'm just going to read this little portion out from this book, in which he talks about how landscapes become invisible to us. So this is a book uh, about Hazari Bagh, which is a hill station in erstwhile Bihar. And uh, Mihir is from Hazari Bagh and he writes about his bond with Hazari Bagh. He talks about how Hazari Bagh has changed him as well as the changes that have come in Hazari Bagh as a place itself. So he's describing the way Hazari Bagh, the landscape is viewed by other people. And uh, he says, I see an active erasure of history and an erasure of poetry too. The history of administration in Hazari Bagh started because of the plateau, not in spite of it. Worth mentioning here that Hazari Bagh is a plateau and that's a very important feature that gives it uh, the kind of salubrious climate that it has. So he says that the history of administration in Hazari Bagh started because of the plateau, not in spite of it. Its recent identification as merely a headquartered town marks a fundamental shift in its perception. It tells me that Hazari Bagh could soon be another tier three city with made up parks, ursas ponds, token forests, shone increasingly of its inherent beauty. So the poet and uh, author is, is lamenting the fact that the landscape of Hazari Park is not being seen as a plateau, but just another place that could uh, be analogous with any other place really in India. And a lot of times biologists such as myself will say and emphasize that no two places are the same in nature. And the beauty of a place or the wildness of a place is very much about the individual features of that place. And the entire and process of making those features visible is very much the work of a natural historian or a conservation scientist or biologist. And um, the way that Mihir uh, talks about the plateau being invisible to people, we often find in many other cities that we see cities as blocks of buildings, but we don't 
see the ecological um, features of, of the city or, or the town. And we don't see the wildlife, we don't see the nature, we just see a city as a forest of buildings, which is a site for our own you know, opportunities and conflicts, but not really as a shared space with other kinds of creatures. We make landscapes around us invisible, but we also tend to not see individual features such as trees. And there's been a lot of recent work on trees and uh, it's absolutely fascinating the kind of uh, things that have, uh, you know, come up. So there's something known as a, a world wide web in which a wood wide web, which means that trees are, have been proven to help each other. When a tree is, is in distress, other trees tend to help it. They have, uh, they have these columns of fungus that they share between their roots. And it's almost like um, a super system underneath the soil. And this has actually led many people to believe that trees are far more sentient and far more um, interconnected than we've given them credit for. Because the original idea always was that in a forest trees will only compete with each other. So while it's true that trees do compete with each other for, for soil, for moisture, for sunlight, it's also true that they help each other. So it's not just uh, this bitter rivalry, it's also a complementarity. And, you know, we also tend to make trees our individual features such as an animal or, or an individual mountain, we tend to make them invisible. And this is this beautiful section from Robert McFarlane's book, Underland, in which he, he, he listens in to a tree. And this is what he has to say. He says, rivers of sap flow in the trees around us. Rivers of sap flow in the trees around us. If we place a stethoscope on the bark of a birch or a beech, we could hear the sap bubbling and crackling as it moves through the trunk. I think Robert is doing a very important service over here. He's actually trying to make the tree more than a system which has a trunk and a and leaves and, and foliage. He's trying to make it out to be an individual in that landscape. And uh, sometimes we notice the individuals that are not human in the landscape around us, but mostly we don't. Normally, our gaze is mediated by size. So if there's a giant, huge banyan tree, maybe we'll notice it. But if it's not so it's not enormous, enormous, it's not so magnetic or gigantic, we do tend to completely overlook and make invisible features around us or individual, be it a tree, be it an animal, uh, be it a ridge of rocks, any kind of natural feature. I want to, um, I want to reflect a little bit on this mother elephant and her calf. So in, the, in this photograph, you see an elephant and her calf. And this is a photograph taken in North Bengal in a tea garden. So those bushes you see behind you are actually uh, 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 tea plants. And the name of the elephant is Ganga. And she's named Ganga because she and her herd of other 13 other elephants would usually take refuge in this tea garden. And tea gardens have come up in a lot of elephant landscape, not, on, not only in West Bengal, but also in Tamil Nadu and Western Ghats. Tea and coffee plantations have broken up the forest. And um, because we pretend that elephants are not there and we, we can't see them, especially when we're making our policy, we can't seem to see the giant of the earth, which is the elephant, we often find ourselves in conflict with them. So this is a, a little passage from Wild and Willful, my book, and I'd just like to read it out. Uh, you know, I'm reflecting over here on the way we erase the paths, the migrations that animals undertake, even an animal as big as an elephant, as undeniable, as irrevocable as an elephant, we tend to not see it. We tend to pretend it's not there. We seem desperate to prove ourselves as the only masters of the land, erasing tracks of any other sentience. 
the earth is grooved by elephant feet and remembered in their minds. A pathway that may not look like a pathway is clear to the animal. It is the animal's entrepreneurship and the herd's collective intelligence for negotiating their way through the hardened earth. So Wild and Willful actually follows the fortunes of this particular herd of elephants in, in, in West Bengal and uh, how their paths got increasingly broken up, not just by tea estates, but by agricultural fields, by railway lines. And um, I think you'll have to read the book to find out what happened to this mother and her calf. But, and I don't want to make this a bloodbath. This, this presentation is not going to be a bloodbath. It is a kind of hint to, as to what happens to them. But in looking at the landscape and in making invisible the others that inhabit the landscape, what we are trying to say is that we control the earth. And we're also trying to say that nothing else exists. That makes us the sole arbitrator in how we decide to use the land and the water and all that we, that we can actually colonize around us. The second is the Ganges River dolphin. And I must you know, spend a couple of minutes talking about this animal because uh, there are so many boxes that an animal such as this uh, actually sits in. So one of the things that the elephant and the dolphin have in common are actually the fact that they're national symbols of India. So the elephant was made the national heritage animal recently. And even more recently, the Ganges River dolphin was made the national aquatic animal of India. And they're both mammals. And coincidentally, the, the elephant I showed you before, this is called Ganga. And this is a, the Ganges River dolphin. They're both kind of named after this uh, incredible symbol, which is the Ganga River of India. The Ganges River dolphin is mostly in India. And India is as important for the Ganges River dolphin as we are for the tiger, because most of the populations of both the tigers and the Ganges River dolphin is in India. And this is an animal that cannot see, that uses sound to communicate. And the irony of the Ganges, of course, is that it is one of the world's holiest rivers, perhaps the holiest river in terms of the number of people who revere the river, who make the effort to go up to it and touch the waters. And maybe analogous to that is the fact that it's also one of the dirtiest rivers. But the Ganga, like the landscape that I'm talking about, in which we make everything else invisible, the Ganga also is consumed by a few boxes, techno-capitalist boxes that we make for it. So one is the box of being a holy river in which man and humanity have the first right to the water and their ownership of the water is, is governed by the fact that religion is, is, is the most important thing. The second more new aspect is that of looking at the water as a stream of commerce. So the Ganga River or the Ganges River is actually the pilot for the National Riverways Act in which highways have been made on the water uh, in order to carry large barges, usually uh, of coal or other traded commodities, which are then taken down the river. And in the book, I, I explore what is happening to the Ganges River Dolphin and whether the Ganges River Dolphin also could be a citizen of the most holy river on earth or one of the holiest rivers on earth. And uh, a lot of uh, work that has happened um, has found that dolphins are becoming increasingly more silent because the noise has increased in the river because of all the activity of the Waterways Act. And uh, the, fact that, the fact that we will on one hand say that this is a national aquatic animal and therefore a great symbol. And on the other hand, we look at the water as a stream of commerce. There is a bit of a dichotomy over there. We, we do not want to share or have any kind of merging between these two things. So we look at the river as something that we own, that exists for ships, for worship, 
but not for dolphins, even if the dolphin is a national symbol for us. We don't see dolphins much and we can't hear them. And we also can't hear or experience what disturbs them. This is no longer a double blind. It is a trifecta of ignorance. So because it's a shy animal, it uh, can't be easily seen by us. Because it communicates these very high-pitched clicks of sound, we can't hear it. And we also can't hear the underwater noise the animal is experiencing every day because a single bubble is really loud underwater. But then we are not underwater. We are creatures of land. And um, we are creatures of land and we generally tend to make invisible anything that's in the water uh, or just not immediately in front of us. So our governance of the river and our recent governance of the river has created this trifecta of ignorance towards this incredible animal. So we've made Ganga and her calf invisible. And we've made the dolphin invisible. The last animal I want to talk about in this segment, I'm bringing up the leopard because you're in Bombay and I'm in Delhi. And one thing that both these great metropolitan cities have in common is the leopard. The leopard is such an interesting animal because it keeps erasing the boundaries we make between the wilderness and our own backyards. So, you know, if the tiger is a symbol of the forest, the leopard is very much a forest animal as well, but it's also an animal that, you know, is able to slip between visibility and invisibility. Firstly, because it's so good at hiding itself and it's such an adaptive animal, but also because it doesn't seem to mind being outside of a forest and closer to where we are. Um, and having said that, even though there are many leopards in India, I think we have at least 20,000 leopards, compare that to maybe 4,000 tigers that we have. Uh, Having said all of this, the fact that we have so many, the fact that, you know, actually people do cite leopards. There are quite a lot of sightings of leopards in agricultural fields, in forests, in mountains, in villages. Even then, the leopard does not occupy the space of respect or visibility that many other animals such as the tiger does. It's interesting because they're both big cats. They're both, you know, magnetic to look at. I mean, you would stop in your tracks if you saw a leopard, but somehow they have escaped us making individuals of them. And leopards, as I've written in the book, are not given names. You know, leopards are not personified by us. No candles are lit for them when they face death sentences written and executed by the human hand. So Wild and Willful talks about leopards all over India that have been picked up and caged just for being sighted and just for existing. So you see a leopard on a university campus, you set a trap and you catch it. You see a leopard in a village, you set a trap and you catch it. You see a leopard inside a forest, uh, which is near people and you set a trap and you catch it and you put it in a zoo or you put it in a deeper part of the forest, not realizing it's probably going to come right back. I find it interesting the way we personify tigers and tigresses, but we don't do that for leopards. I think possibly it's because leopards are more common, possibly our uh, act of making something visible and acknowledging that it exists is actually mediated by how uncommon something is. So the fact that maybe tigers are more uncommon, even though tigers also will be seen near cities, there are tigers outside Bhopal right now, there are tigers uh, in Sundarbans, there are tigers in the Himalayas, and tigers are often found in bedrooms and uh, bathrooms also. In Kaziranga every year when it floods, uh, there are tigers that land up inside people's houses. So it's not that tigers are not seen. Tigers are also seen, but I think maybe the fact that they are lesser in number or maybe we, we idealize the tiger as an ultimate symbol of, of the wilderness. Maybe that is why we actually there are no candlelight marches for leopards um, and there's no squeak 
that comes out from society as a whole if anybody decides to pick up a leopard and just um you know take it to jail i want to read out a little portion from the book on a tigress this time what i'm going to suggest now is that uh when we are getting familiar with the wild animal a lot of the times wild animals are part of our wildlife conservation schemes and uh, they have to perform a role within that scheme they have to perform a utilitarian role within that scheme so on one hand i'm saying that the leopard is still invisible to us and the leopard still becomes um a sort of scapegoat for many kind of ideas that we have that we shouldn't have leopards here this is not the place for it to be it should be somewhere else on the other hand tigers sit at the center of our absolutely flagship conservation program which is project tiger so we have a network of tiger reserves in india we have more than 50 tiger reserves it's it's the oldest conservation scheme from independent india it is well funded and that's not to say tigers um are doing very well that's not to say tiger reserves don't face threats they do and uh, you know tigers are always under threat also from from poaching and from habitat loss but uh, it's also interesting how uh, the way that we uh, expect tigers to fulfill our conservation targets it's it's quite interesting so this book has a longish portion on Saraska Tiger Reserve which was actually the first tiger reserve in India to lose all its tigers uh, in about 2005 it lost all its tigers um to poaching and to other pressures poisoning of the tigers so when the tigers went extinct it was decided that tigers from Ranthambhor which is another reserve in Rajasthan same state as Saraska it was decided that tigers from ranthambore would be brought in to saraska and the interesting part about this and i would like all of us to think about this again is what happens when an animal is a symbol and what happens when real life actually clashes with that symbol so i i explained earlier about dolphins or 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 elephants being symbols for india but what we are doing to them on the ground not always being analogous with that you know our our uh, commerce and our industry and you know the land use decisions we take are often not conducive to actually the reverence for that symbol but similarly you know with the tiger extinction in saraska this was a huge loss of face for the rajasthan government it was a loss of face for project tiger which is a centrally funded scheme and so we are looking at this issue from many levels there is at one level the kind of global gaze on india to do something now that tigers have become extinct there is the state level where you know there is a loss of face and they feel something needs to be done and you need a masculine solution or a solution that's kind of different and grand breaking because it's the first time that it's ever happened there's a need to show that something is being done and then there are the villagers of saraska and you know whether they are you know their opinion is taken into consideration or not is an open question uh, so you have people who live with the animal you have people who administer the tiger reserve you have people in the center or uh, which is uh, delhi you know uh who are associated with the ministry of environment and forest and project tiger and finally you have this cosmopolitan community of people which includes you know indians or foreigners who have an idea of what should be happening to tigers so now uh, in this book at this point i i am talking about tigresses being brought on an indian air force chopper from ranthambore to saraska tiger reserve and i'm talking about what is happening to those tigers so basically the tigers were brought to saraska to breed right so um in many ways the attitudes towards women which is the women of the village who live inside the reserve in many ways the attitudes towards women were reflected in the attitudes towards tigers the moniker gaon ki bahu 
for the women who settled as brides in the forest villages could have been another word for the tigresses that had been brought into Sariska to fill the area with tiger cubs. The tigresses hadn't been brought there for their intrinsic worth. It was not about a tigress's precise pause falling on the earth with the fury of the monsoon carving rivers out of the earth. It was not about the fear that shimmered like smoke between her and her prey animals or the choices she made as she negotiated with this new land and its new sounds. The tigresses were brought there to procreate. The first move happened in 2008. There were two tigresses in Sariska, but until 2010, no cubs had been born. Despite the pedestals the tigresses were put on, even they could not escape the abuse of sexism. A grizzled old forest guard sitting in the passenger seat of the gypsy vehicle nodded to me. Ye banjar hai. The tigress is infertile, he said to me, with all the entitled authority of an old male talking about feminine virtue. The staff hungered for results, chiefly a cute cub that would be a celebrity even before it was born. So basically over here, what we had in Sariska was the fact that there was so much pressure to show results and to look at an animal in a utilitarian way, uh, expecting it to perform according to our five-year plans is probably a folly. And it's only when I think the monitoring eased and you know, people, uh, the, the forest department and the conservation community as a whole, they gave everybody there, including the tigers and tigresses, the space to exhale that the reserve could actually fill up with cubs. And now there are plenty of tigers there. But initially, uh, when you had this entire move happening, there was so much scrutiny of the tigress, almost like the way women are scrutinized after they get married to have produced heirs and children. And it was, to me, um, again, the clash between the conflict between the symbol and what really should be done and what actually gets done. I'll move on to the second part of the talk. I'll come back to the tigers. The first part was about what we make invisible. So we are making the nature of the animal invisible. We are not able to see the landscape for what it is and its natural features. We are not able to see individual features even. But the second, perhaps more soft or more um, relatable thing for us is what really is revealed, what really is visible to us in our daily lives. And most of us live in cities. Even those who work in faraway places of field work, most of us do live in cities. And there's actually so much to see in cities very easily right there in front of us. So I'll start with this beautiful tree, the Bombax Seba. It's there in many Indian cities. Uh, it's this incredible tall tree. It, it, it basically looks like the textbook definition of what a tree should look like, which is a tall tree with wide open arms. And it's an Indian tree and it will blossom dramatically only once a year, that is at springtime. And when it blossoms, it's like a, Fantas Goram is like a feast for everybody. Everybody is just, everything that eats flowers and nectar is on this tree. So birds and bats and animals are on this tree uh, getting drunk on its nectar. So on the left, you have plum-headed parakeets, um, which is a bird that's fairly uncommon in Delhi, but you do see them on this tree, which is the same old tree. And on the right, of course, you have a national symbol, <laughs> the national bird of India, the peacock sitting on the same mall. And um, I think plants are a very interesting way to look at nature. And I think if we have to talk about what in nature or in the wild is visible to us, I think we can start with plants. I think in many ways, we start and end our lives with plants. So when a baby is born, people will give flowers, anything nice happens, you know, we will get flowers. And um, 
I think all of us interact with plants in our life, even if we don't interact with animals. So flowers in the garden, you know, a cactus corner in a university campus. And um, I think we do tend to notice if a huge tree is flowering in front of us. Um, this is another Indian tree. Uh, on the left, it's the Palash, the Butea monosperma. And if you look carefully, it's a purple sunbird in the middle of the picture. It's a drinking nectar from the palash. And this is also a tree that only blossoms once a year, more towards summer, it's blossoming right now in, um, in North India and Central India. And on the right, this is a flower from my garden. This is a passiflora. It's not an Indian flower. And that's a gull butterfly on it. What I'm trying to suggest here is that if we are to talk about what is visible to us in wildlife, I think plants are a very interesting way to start. I think plants are visible to us and also plants very easily blur the boundary between the exotic and the native. So in this slide, actually, that's why I have these two plants next to each other. The palash is native and the passiflora uh, is not native for Delhi. And uh, I think if you look at the world as a garden, then um, plants are a symbol of wilderness and also the human enterprise of carrying them around and basically creating landscapes which are completely shaped by the human hand. So there are all kinds of plants, all kinds of places which they're not supposed to be. Sometimes that's a problem, but very often plants that get naturalized um, do very well. So, you know, you have so many trees and plants in India, which are not from here. The Gulmohar is an example, the Tabi Bua is another example. And these are amazing flowering trees that we see and we appreciate. And they help in making perhaps our built environments more habitable and more welcoming for us. And um, uh, they help us feel one with nature. So when I ask people, what is it about nature they enjoy? Mostly they will say being in a park, under a flowering tree, under a shady tree, under some kind of tree. And a lot of these trees are not always native. So I think plants do a great service in actually making nature visible to us. I also want to reflect a little bit on how natural heritage becomes um, a heritage that we like to subsume or we like to adopt. So this is the Baya weaver on the right, this beautiful mango yellow bird, which um, builds this incredible nest that you see on the left. It's also sitting on the nest on the right. And uh, for many of us, uh, this is a symbol of rural India, this urn shaped nest. It kind of looks like a vase upside down and a single bird will make more than one nest in order to get a female. And they like to nest on thorny trees like this date palm over here. And they like to nest near wetlands uh, because that keeps the nest safe from predators. And so basically what this bird needs is grasses and wetlands and um, thorny, thorny trees, thorns and grass and water is what this bird needs. And when I travel for my field work, I see people with this nest in their house so often. People go and they get the nest and they keep it at home because they think it's beautiful. And it's an example of something that's natural or built by wildlife becomes a part of our culture. It enters our oral traditions and it enters our houses and our homes as a welcome piece of art, really. And uh, in many ways, you know, if we explore more local cultures in India, uh, there are many, many examples. Paya Viva is just one of them, but there are many examples of something that's been built by a non-human coming into a human's life. So here is where I want to suggest that the visible and the invisible do interact with each other. And there are liminal spaces um, in which the wild comes in touch with our daily Qtodian lives. And there's a very interesting interaction. Sometimes it's conflict, but oftentimes it's just an encounter or just a visit or a meeting, a greeting sometimes. And here is where I want to talk a little bit more about Sariska because this is um, 
such an interesting insight from the villages of Saraska. So I conducted a hundred interviews in Saraska Tiger Reserve, which is the same place that lost all its tigers and it was repopulated with tigers from Ranthambore. And I basically asked the villagers whether the tiger should persist in Saraska Tiger Reserve um, because they were brought back. And what do the villagers think about that? And whose tiger is it really? Does the tiger belong to the National Tiger Conservation Authority? Does it belong to the Rajasthan government? Does it belong to the local villager? Does it belong to the conservationist? Who does it belong to? Who has ownership over this animal? And uh, most people said the tiger should persist in Sariska. Most people also said that the tiger is the animal that causes most fear in them. It was a triangle. The tiger was their favorite animal, but it was also the animal that made them the most frightened. And the third aspect was the tiger needed to be there for them to feel like they were safe. So just to go a little bit into the, the reasons people gave as to why the tiger should persist. Some people said it should not, but the majority said that it should. And some of them gave reasons why. So some have said that the, the jungle is lonely without the tiger. Some people said that if the tiger is there, no disease will come in their cattle, which is actually a proven theory today in conservation biology, that when you have livestock, uh, the fear that a predator creates actually keeps them healthy, keeps their immune system healthy. And sometimes this has been proved in a case in, in wolves in Yellowstone, wolves and elk that um, there would be a diseased animal in the herd and the wolf or the apex predator picks up that animal and basically saves the rest of the herd to spread of disease. Or, you know, the healthy animals stay, remain healthy, have the good functioning immune systems because they're afraid that there's a predator over there. So some people said that the jungle is lonely without the tiger. And they use the word jungle in Hindi. I've kept the word in English. Some said it should persist because it's beautiful. Some said that it should persist because it's the king of the forest. And the number of cattle they keep goes up, meaning the production rate of the livestock goes up if there's a tiger in the forest. Uh, some said that it should persist because it provides employment. And some said, most interestingly, that there is no forest without the tiger. It's worth saying over here that these are extremely remote villages where no conservation messaging has really gone out. So it's not like they've been brainwashed into saying this. It is a kind of local uh, uh, wisdom or a, or a local knowledge, which um, uh, I guess they, they see the tiger as part of the ecosystem. They see the livestock as part of the ecosystem as well. And the interaction of the tiger and the livestock um, is something that's the natural order of things. And uh, the villages that were closer to roads and closer to the buffer areas of the tiger reserve had a slightly different view. They had a more commodified view of their cattle and they got very angry when the tiger would eat their cattle. But actually that was a minority view. The majority view was that cattle do get eaten, but that's just the way of the forest. And uh, also that there's a kind of logic to what the tiger does. There's a kind of logic to, to the movement of the animal, the way it patrols the forest, and it has an agency. And agency is one of my favorite topics and also something I want to cover in this talk because when I say that we make wildlife and the natural world invisible, that's also because we do not feel that it has any agency or that it's shorn of logic, it has, it has no meaning, it is meaningless and abstract and basically something that's a nuisance to our plants. And this is an interesting idea put forward by um, Mahesh Rangarajan, M.B. Madhusudan and Ghazala Shahabuddin, who were the editors of this anthology called Nature Without Borders. And this is what they said in the foreword, nature and culture, human and animal, the wild and the sown were and indeed are enmeshed, even if not in harmony and sometimes in sharp conflict. It is by asking how they are interwoven that we can actually move ahead. So I find this an extremely empowering idea. It's not black or white. It is not 
tiger versus tribal or leopard versus citizen of uh, delhi it, it's actually it's actually a braid that's interwoven so in the way that you have um, the tiger being the favorite animal in saraska as well as the most feared it's an interwoven braid it's like a braid with a with a strand of fear and a strand of respect along with a strand of adoration and love almost and here is where i come to the love part and the agency part this amazing man his name is baba ji sita ram das from chatisgarh he is in wild and willful he's one of the stars of my book you can't see in this picture he doesn't have one forearm because it got eaten by a crocodile and he got attacked by this crocodile uh, she was defending her hatchlings but he's de devoted his life to taking care of mother crocodiles and the book suggests that he has a love that does not depend on reciprocity for these animals he has a love that respects and understands the agency and the boundaries that that animal has and the book says that people look for relatability even in non human faces and the perfect predator has never felt the need to be relatable so a lot of the times when we consider reptiles which are scary for most people i think the reason why we find reptiles scary is because they don't have eyebrows they don't have these flat faces that say a dog has or uh, it's not an expressive face like even a dolphin's face is more expressive than that of a reptile and a crocodile's face is like stone faced it's it's it has no expression you don't know what it's thinking you can't get a cue as to the ethology of the animal and this man who has dedicated his life to saving and nurturing crocodiles in the place that he lives which is kotni sanar in chatisgarh he tells me that his love for the animals has nothing to do with what they feel for him they live together in this shared space of tolerance and a shared space of mutual respect so there are a few things he will not do around the crocodiles there are a few things that they will not do around him and this is not a story of bravado this is not a story of false pride it's not a story of doing something for the camera there are no cameras there it is a story of understanding animal behavior and living a life which accommodates that animal behavior which is actually the story of many many indians who live along with wild and willful animals but they live in a peaceful way because they have taken the trouble to understand the behavior of that animal now i want to show you one more person from the book and i i love this lady her name is manjeet kaur she's also from chatisgarh from raipur and i find her so inspirational because first of all she rescues snakes she's holding a snake in her hand it's a rat snake rat snake is a snake that looks a lot like a cobra and gets killed because it's considered to be venomous even though it is not and she actually um, became a, a snake rescuer and a conservationist because she saw that everybody was killing snakes around her so manjeet in a single way breaks many boxes first of all she herself catches the snake which is amazing for most people who would look at her they you know people wouldn't look at an indian woman and be like oh you can catch a snake the second is she's telling people what to do in a place where not a lot of women are you know telling other people what to do she has a position of authority that comes from her experience it's not a authority that she's throwing on other people it comes from the experience and the wisdom that she's gained and she um again will say that it is about understanding the animal and accommodating in your life accommodating it in your life rather than heightening conflict by trying to kill it or trying to hate it and holding a grudge against it and this is what she says in the book she says i tell people i am not saving you from the snake i am saving the snake from you and this is my little insight on being peaceful uh there are many things in our lives that are outside of our control and i think accepting the wild which is very much in our lives and trying to understand it trying to tolerate it and to find it within us to live with it could actually make us more peaceful in the way that manjeet and baba ji have found peace purpose and meaning in their lives and i'm going to end now and i just wanted to end by saying 
that we are not alone. And uh, even the more invisible things that I spoke about in the first half of this presentation, even the more invisible things, you know, the leopards, the tigers, the, 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 the elephants in tea gardens and the dolphins in, in the Hooghly River in Kolkata, for example, we don't see them that much, but, but they're there. Their shadow and their presence is part of the lives of some of us. But of course, there are other animals that are much more visible to us. And I think to say we are not alone, to say that it's not just a human world, it's not just a human sentience that makes our world, is, is, is one way to understand our place in this world. And I'm going to actually end with um, a gold friend of mine. His name is Ajay Marskole. He's from He's from Madhya Pradesh. He talks about um, his favorite place in the world. Okay, so this is what he says. I'm standing with Ajay Marskole in Sioni. Ajay is a Gon tribal. He has heard Mowgli's story and believes that the child could have been raised by non-humans because he views the forest as a living entity capable of constantly surprising, surprising us. He picks up messages from the forest as if intercepting telegrams that no one else uses anymore. He's 35 years old, muscular, and able to blend into the forest with the ease only a person who has been born to the land can possess. Where we see trees, the gorns see characters and old friends. Ajay and his friends want to take me to their place. It's their favorite place in the world. We walk through the forest, a rainfall of dappled forest light falling on the floor. We climb up a slope and come to a large clearing. It's a stand of natural rock. An old banyan tree grows here, breaking through the rock. This tree is their place. City people coming to the land of the jungle book would see a ficus tree, but these citizens see a building, a being, a sentience. I wonder how many would consider a tree itself to be a place and how much we can learn from a grown man who wears his heart on a banyan tree leaf. I'd like to end here. Thank you so much for listening to me. That's my Twitter, if anybody wants to be in touch. That, you know, it's marvelous that you've relayed the book, but also shared um, so much of, your, of the biographical context and the concerns from which the book emerges. So what we're gonna do now is both Ravi and I will uh, be in conversation with you with this kind of brings this whole series to a conclusion. And I think there were some very important questions that you flagged, beginning with your characterization of uh, fellow sentient beings, non-humans as uh, citizens. So I just wanna maybe as a first question, tease out uh, the meanings of that, especially in terms of um, habitation, uh, belonging, uh, rights to a territory, because that's a trope that comes up often in your book, whether in terms of the elephant corridors uh, or what you just talked about, the relocation of tiger populations in another context, um, notions of uh, compensatory afforestation. My question is seemingly sort of utopian as against the whole techno-capitalist system that we work in. Uh, how do we go about recognizing, in some sense, the personhood and the rights of uh, non-human animals or fellow sentient beings? So it, it's rather a large question, but I'm just wondering if even at the micro level, you can maybe address it in some way. That's a wonderful question. Thank you. So this is why I wanted to talk about the things that we willfully don't see the invisible to the things that are invisible to us because the very first the basic groundwork of this is that we can't see or we refuse to see 
any animal in front of us or any wildlife any natural feature and that's why you know the tigress not being recognized as having her own agency is important so not only do we not see them we don't give them any agency because giving agency is 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 a much higher level than being able to see something be, giving agency is actually recognizing that that being can actually think for itself it, it lives a life of negotiation with the landscape and also with other you know other non humans and other humans in the landscape there's a rights based approach that that is being recognized around the world in various capacities which try to give rights to nature and natural features rivers most particularly and there was actually also a judgment of the uh, of the uttarakhand high court for ganga which also hinted at the at a something similar that 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 a river the ganga river has a right to flow and it's a legal entity and it's interesting because even corporations are legal entities even the idol inside a temple is a legal entity but we don't uh, look at say the tigress in sariska or the the elephant mother inside the tea garden as a legal entity or any kind of entity at all we just look at them we don't see them or we see them as a nuisance now the only issue with legal being a legal entity is how do you represent a non human when something bad happens to it so for example in the case of a river uh it has a legal guardian and the legal guardian are exactly the same people who let the river get polluted such as you know Uh, important officials in the state administration so the issue kind of comes back to how we represent that animal so how do we recognize it do we see it do we recognize it and how do we represent it in the court of law or in our policy making and it's so anthropocentric that uh, it seems like a very difficult question having said that i think these conversations should include the tribal we should have we need to have the indigenous person sitting at the same table with the joint secretary and that's why i wanted to end with my own friend because he has much more knowledge of the forest than i can ever hope to learn and um i think the least that we can do for animals and wildlife is to represent them through people who are the most qualified to speak about them because otherwise we go back to the same system of this very patriarchal approach in which you think you know best and you're talking on behalf of the tiger or the ganga river or the dolphin etc so i would say it's a kind of multi layered representation that we should try to start uh, having and any kind of big project needs to consider not just the presence of those animals but also how those animals view the landscape so if you're going to make a railway line to the western ghats connecting say hubli to ankola which is a project that's been pending we have to think like an elephant because there are elephants over there and elephants routinely die you know getting crushed by railway that's a spoiler for the ganga story sadly in the book but that's a reality for elephants today so i would say we need a kind of multi layered uh, representation uh made by humans for the non humans and the second is it is important to think like the animal when we are planning as well what are their corridors how do they negotiate the area uh, thank you neha Uh, actually uh, the question of personhood and agency is so critical and you raise it so beautifully in the in the very hopeful messages you give out to the stories which you tell and i can't agree with you more about representation uh, of different voices which know the landscape much more than we do so i often think uh, and you refer to the utra utra utrakhand judgment which and also to the other cases around the world in new zealand in ecuador in colombia uh where there have been social movements in new zealand particularly it was a long standing movement uh which then led to the judgment and the person who presided with the with the protectors of the of 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 the uh, of the river and that was the local indigenous people there who were given personhood in india however the personhood was given to a bureaucrat and didn't really stick so in a sense in a country which has claims to have a long conservation ethos uh it is kind of surprising to reckon that we don't have those social voices 
which we claim to have, uh, where multi-species existences such as the snake lady, I forget her name, and there have been uh, so many other instances which we know of where, uh, for example, which you worked on earlier, vultures, how they survive in, in villages, but how they have been, uh, they don't have the voice to them. Uh, so the question to my mind, which I want to ask you is, yes, another voice, which is good, you can hear that. I'm so sorry, yes. that's it's mine. Lovely, <laughs> yes, I think we should hear it. <laughs> he um, always does that. Yes. <laughs> <An> agreement. <laughs> I think we should, it's a sign. Uh, but the question to my mind often comes is, how much are our disciplines such as conservation biology, and it's a provocative question because you are one, but a different kind of conservation biologist. How much are we responsible for making these divisions more firm than they should be how much are our techniques of looking at uh, conservation, looking at uh, how we know, um, make policy, mm -hmm. how are we uh, ourselves implicit in these separations and firming them up? Thank you. I think most of this goes back to the prohibition of hunting, which was in the 1970s, because um, Hunting was very uh, was done by two kinds of people. One were the upper class nobility, etc., who hunted for pleasure, and the others were people who lived near forests, around forests, or maybe not forests, just people who uh, usually who were tribals, forest dwellers, or other marginalized communities who used hunting to survive. And there has to be a distinction made between food, trapping animals for food and trapping them or killing them for pleasure because there's a very different social and economic aspect to both. And I think the divide that very much exists even today is kind of because of this um, early legislation on hunting. Now, I do think that there is a very big problem of poaching in India but poaching of the of which is part of the illicit international trade is not the same as the hunting of animals. The other issue is also that um, uh, it's impossible to regulate anything, which is why probably India has so many bans because regulation is just so tough. One of the things that gives me heart is the fact that what we actually need in conservation, and I think the Amur Falcon program of Nagaland, of which I'm very privileged to be a part. One of the things that conservation needs is to give it more time. You know, a ban is a very blunt instrument. It's an instrument that's very forceful, very blunt, it has no nuance. But the Amur Falcon program kind of took its time and it basically laid all the facts in front of the people and asked them to make a choice. And given the fact that Amur Falcons are migratory birds that come from Russia, and then they go to Nagaland, and they go to South Africa. It's a bird, little bird with a big, big wingspan and a big, big journey. Uh, interacting with those people and also trying to take cognizance of what are the other problems they have, which may lead them to hunting. Because, you know, issues of conservation are not always issues of hatred between a person and an animal or a bird. It is very much a product of a social or a very particular situation, it's something to do with that village and that place, kind of trouble that they have. And they require any community that we speak to, whether it's urban or rural, there's a context and the context is everything. So, you know, uh, to say, for example, that there should be a ban on stubble burning, which is another very good example, because it, it is not to do exactly with conservation, but it kind of represents the complexities that one faces when trying to achieve clean air, but you, you haven't taken into consideration the difficulties, the nuances, the challenges. What I'm trying to say is that these kind of activities need time and more than anything, they need context. Context is everything. And uh, the blunt instruments need to be made a little less blunt and we need a lot more intersectionality. And unfortunately, I find that missing in most disciplines. I'm a feminist and I can't find common ground with you know, a lot of my feminism tends to be very upper class, for example. And, you know, I, 
I <clears throat> find it hard to find intersectionality even within that movement. And I think we love our silos quite a bit. And I think the conversation though is changing. I think it is becoming more democratic and it's a slow process. Nobody likes to give up their power or their positions of, you know, that they have kind of gathered. But I do think it's changing. There are lots of community led conservation models today, which are amazing. The snow leopard work is amazing. And snow leopard is a very interesting case story because that too is a case of the animal eating livestock in the way the tigers of Saraska eat livestock. The snow leopard eats livestock in a very difficult place, a place which is facing climate change. But solutions have been found through insurance, through group dynamics, and, and by recognizing that people do have problems. And those problems also need some solution. You can't just tell them what to do. You can't parachute in, give them five things to do, and leave. So long-term engagement and context, and I, and I think we're getting there slowly. We're crawling in that direction. Neha, I wanted to flag the Amur Falcon story, and you've talked about it already. Uh, but it, to me, it was an extraordinary occasion where a community of hunters in Nagaland uh, actually are brought into a space of dialogue because what they're doing affects the interests of birds that come from Siberia and communities in South Africa. So. It's an amazing situation where you have a locally embedded problem where you actually begin a dialogue about a sort of a trans-regional ethics. And it is persuasive because there's so much uh, by way of empathy that's, that gets invested in that. So I know you've, you've already spoken about the Amur Falcon issue now in a certain way, but could you speak to this issue of how do you uh, uh, build these mechanisms of empathy? How do you, how do you, uh, in effect, really improvise this kind of what I think of as a trans regional ethic? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think, I think the reason it worked is because they're international birds. I think the reason we got the attention and we, so I think the urban gaze on a hunter. Is, is a very is a gaze is is a gaze that the hunter is a villain, or the hunter is a really bad guy. So you know you watch a movie and there's a bad guy, so the hunter for the urban mind is that villain. And obviously it's not like that. People hunt, people do hunt for fun, but people also hunt because they want to eat or they want to sell it and they want to get something out of it. And uh, to us it seems shamelessly utilitarian. But the fact also is that choices are very limited in certain places. And in Nagaland, uh, you know, in all the ethnographic interviews I've conducted, it's clear that they eat for protein, they hunt for protein, but they also hunt for fun. They hunt because it's a community exercise. It's something the father does with his son, usually. And um, so in the city, I have 10 things to do when I'm bored. You know, on a mountaintop, those things are limited. So the first, the very first prism in which I look at this issue when I got into it in 2013, I needed to kind of discard my cape of being a conservationist who looks at a hunter as a bad guy. And um, I can't say that it came to me very easily because um, I saw the pictures, uh, the way the birds were hunted, and I had a very visceral reaction to them because they were crying uh, and shrieking. But, uh, you know, the idea of shame and guilt is a very interesting one because we like to shame the other. And in the case of Nagaland, this, it's a textbook case of the other, you know, because people in mainland India have many ideas about how, how Nagas are. And the most interesting and damaging euphemism you'll hear is that Nagas eat everything that moves. And so therefore, whenever I spoke to any agency about this issue, we never got help initially because we were told that this, is, this has been happening for hundreds of years. They eat anything that moves, et cetera, et cetera. And it's disgusting and they're never going to change. So I had to kind of make sure that I don't go in with a prism of trying to shame them, first of all, because just because everybody has a particular view doesn't mean that view is correct. The second is, 
uh, giving them the information and asking them to make the choice because we gave it so much time because it's been 10 years now it was a gradual thing it didn't happen overnight but just giving it that much time and not just thinking of the end goal but the process of it and the fact that it's an international bird really struck a chord because they didn't know that. They thought it comes from Arunachal Pradesh. So the idea that it comes from outside India, then it crosses the sea. And the fact that it's a really, you know, it's very um, harmless kind of bird. It's kind of shocking because it's a falcon. But when you catch it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't kind of gouge your eyes out or claw your skin. It just sits there. And all the hunters I met would always say, it's such a dumb bird. You know, it's such a dumb bird. It's so easy to catch this bird, you know, like it just wants to be caught. And I think the fact that they considered it a dumb bird also kind of contributed to the fact that they felt bad for it because, you know, it's making this long journey. And we also, you know, worked with the children. So there are eco clubs over there and the children were very instrumental in talking to their parents. And we said that the Amul falcons will have baby Amul falcons and they're going to go to South Africa and eat the termites over there. And they eat termites everywhere. So if you save them here, you know, the kids of South Africa will benefit because termites are a huge pest because at the time of the rains, you know, there's huge termite clouds, which and locust clouds as well, which decimate everything. And I think the, the in, international nature of the bird really helped the case of the Amur falcon. And it would be different for different species, but I just want to emphasize over here that it's very unfortunate to have a view of a villager as an evil guy. It's very easy to make them the other, the savage other. And obviously I would press for a more compassionate and more ethical view, really. Uh, thank you. Um, um, you. You say such uh, things which are so important, I think. The words you used of time, intersectionality, context, these are such critical words to my mind because they change everything. They change the idea of um, normative behaviors, they change imposition, they make uh, everything more complex and uh, interrelated. So I really think this is, this is excellent uh, to hear this from a conservation biologist such as yourself. But I just want to also uh, ask what you think about what's happening in, uh, in the majority of spaces like urban cities and urban nature where people don't even want to have trees now, they want to. So there is one side of where, what you lay out, uh, and there's other side of this, uh, this huge populations of us, which have this complete sanitized view of our lives, which don't want any nature around us, which sees nature as a threat. And how do we, uh, how do we reconcile this? How do we move forward with this? And uh, how does uh, thoughts such as yours, which are, I think, uh, uh, very contemporary ideas uh, where the stories become totally different, how do they become more mainstream? And I ask you because you also work on policy in Big NHS. And how do, you, how do you take this forward? How should we take this forward? Well, that's the reason why I wrote the book, <laughs> because I wanted to be able to make wildlife and willful wildlife that we look at as a nuisance. I wanted to make it visible. But to answer your question, there are two things I see happening. A, people think they're not part of nature and that somehow we can live, you know, without air and water and feeling of wellness, which you get when you're outside outdoors. But, uh, and B, you see a lot of people grasping on to the last vestiges of nature everywhere. So while yes, there are people everywhere that we are, there are people who can't stand pigeons because they have droppings, they can't stand trees because they drop leaves, they can't uh, stand uh, parks because it should be a parking lot. A park should be a parking lot for vehicles, et cetera. 
You know, there also are so many people today who are standing up for nature in a very serious and sustained manner. So for the Arablis in Delhi, Gurgaon, Faridabad, there are people who are not conservationists who have gone to court. You know about this, Ravi, and you were also part of such a long movement to save the Delhi Ridge. And, you know, there are court cases that have gone on for 10 years and are still going on. There was just a, the matter of the Aravi to have heard just today in the Supreme Court. And in Bombay, you have the RA movement, you have the movement against the coastal road. In Pune, you have movements to save the river and to, to save even, you know, two trees, three trees, 50 trees, Bangalore as well. I think both things are happening. And it was also interesting the way the pandemic brought people closer to a kind of more atavistic view of nature or a more uh, kind of a feeling that we were alone when we were inside our houses. So when the pandemic first started, I was flooded on my Twitter with, by people saying, oh my God, I saw this bird outside my window. And I've never seen this bird before. And it's just a rufous tree pie, you know, it's like the most common bird. It's just that they didn't have the time to notice it earlier, or they would actually record bird song and, 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 and upload it to my Twitter and ask me which bird it is, etc. And there was a kind of renewed enthusiasm and interest and curiosity. And I think the one thing that people who love nature have that others don't is that idea of engaging with the world with curiosity and interest and being excited, even if you see a Rufus tree pie. And so I see both things happening. And I think the ecosystem services concept actually um, tries to address this issue of looking at nature as something that gives us services. And in so many ways, you know, I'm happy you called my thoughts contemporary. I, I don't often get along with many conservationists uh, because I, you know, I have different thoughts on this issue. In many ways, I feel a lot of indigenous people or tribal people fully understand what ecosystem services are. And they fully, you know, understand what they have to lose, you know, if, uh, if the forest is not there or the grassland is not there. And, I think the ecosystem services concept is a modern response to those who will say that you don't, shouldn't have tree leaves littering the earth or you shouldn't have birds dropping everything. Uh, there are people, there are cities in the world which cover trees with a kind of net so that birds do not sit on them. Good luck to them trying to control everything. The way that I see it, if there's a, a wasp nest in my garden and I can work my way around it, it's like a microcosm for me solving greater problems in life because me learning that I can't control everything has really made me a peaceful person. Me learning instead to be accepting has made me more peace peaceful with all the social and political things that happen around me. And um, the idea that we can control nature and that we own the world, we are the sole owners of the world, got challenged during the pandemic. And I think a lot of people felt that, that, you know, we are not in control. And so I hope that more ecological citizenship comes out, out of this. And I actually do see it quite a bit everywhere. A lot of young Indians and not so young Indians, Indians just standing up for causes that mean something to them in a very serious way. I'm not saying one protest march. I'm saying marches over months and years that have gone on for very long. I'm sure we have questions whether from the on-site or the online audience. But one question from me before we get there, which is to do really with how you've organized your book. So this is more a literary question. Uh, it's in four sections and uh, it seems as if it's the elements, but there's a surprise there. So could I, could I ask you to address that? Yes, so we have earth and um... Um, air and we have water and we have heart. So, I mean, I've studied conservation science, but I understand that science does not dictate all our decisions. And I think it would be folly to kind of imagine that we take all our decisions on a mechanical basis. I think appeal to the heart perhaps lies at the core of many things. Uh, that we decide on. I think even difficult policy matters has something to do with an emotional core, with a kernel of, of values. And values do come from a normative space. They come from a space of emotion. And that's why the section of heart is so important for me in this book. And I think um, it kind of ties up the wild and willful things in the book 
which are in the other portions. The, the first few portions are a little bit sad. They're doing bad things to the animals and the animals are injured or people are dying, etc. But the heart portion is about how we can find a way to live together. Because I actually, you know, on a very practical basis, I don't think there's a future unless we can learn how to live together. Cities are not going anywhere. We're going to have more urbanization and therefore we need to figure out urban ecology, how to keep our cities habitable also for us, but also for the animals. And, uh, you know, if you're talking about national symbols, as I hinted in this talk, you know, the idea of a national symbol also is one that comes from an ethical or a normative space. And to choose conservation of something, to choose that, to choose to cherish something comes from an emotional space. And I think there's so many emotional decisions we take in polity. You know, there's no reason that conservation shouldn't be one of them, you know. Uh, ideas of secularism and uh, women and child development, they're not emotional, but it, it has to do with an ethic. It's an ethic that community or society decides that, you know, this is how we should be. And I think conservation also is one of those kind of decisions that society takes. But it's good that we don't cut a tree or we shouldn't shoot a tiger or, you know, it's nice to have biodiversity and animals should not be in cages. These are all values that society kind of reaches some kind of consensus on. And um, I think the issue of heart and conservation being linked to something that's very close to me personally. And I think I also would be myopic if I don't address the fact that emotion does come into conservation and policy making and even legal judgments, you know. I would love it if conservation is only driven by science, but we are human beings and we are not driven just by science or mathematics. We need poetry and we need heart and we need literature. Maybe that's why I write books, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Were there questions from the I think there's a question coming up now. Uh, nice to hear you. We had a, a lecture uh, sometime back on the viruses also. And uh, as uh, we know, the human's greed is uh, very large, cannot be satisfied. We eat pets, we eat wild animals, we eat bats and the pangolins and then the virus comes. So do you think that the virus is sent by nature slash or God to protect the animals? Thank you, what an interesting question. Uh, sir, I don't actually believe that it is sent by God, but I, nature is like a system. I don't think nature is a person or a God, I don't think like we often say mother nature, like as if nature is something that takes care of us. I don't think that it's a woman that's taking care of us. It's a system that we've evolved with. And because we've all evolved together, there are many things in nature that are beneficial for us. But at the same time, there are also things in nature that harm us. And climate change and all the changes that we have caused, you know, in, in warming the earth have actually uh, we're going to face many more problems now because we've changed some of these systems that we actually traditionally evolved with. So there are viruses even in permafrost in the, in the North Pole or the South Pole. And as the snow melts, we're probably going to have more viruses escaping into the, into the atmosphere. And I think what happened with COVID is that the animal was stressed out and it shed some viruses onto a intermediate host into, into the pangolin. And then it came to people, it jumped from zoonotic to, uh, from as a zoonotic virus, it came to us. And uh, many people have said that the lesson to be learned is not to stress animals out so much or not to, you know, disturb habitats so much that the animal becomes susceptible to disease because disease is actually also psychosomatic. When our immune system breaks down, we become more prone to disease and uh, to actually shedding viruses. And so my answer to that is, I don't think it's a God, it is a system. And if the system gets challenged, we are going to be facing many more challenges. And it's also worth saying over here, sir, that nature will always carry on in some way or the other. 
probably some animals will go extinct if we don't change. But nature will always be here. Earth will always be here. It is us who will need to face the changes that come with climate change, really. So if it is a god, then it is an agnostic god. It's a god that kind of doesn't take sides, I would say. Neha, thank you for your response. So we have another question here from uh, Van Scherer. <clears throat> thank you very much for this great presentation. My question is, and to some extent you hinted at it several times to this aspect, is the invisibility of nature directly related also to the invisibility of these indigenous communities uh, who uh, are living with nature? So strategies to bring nature back into the social discourse, uh, to which extent do they have to relate to political and social uh, strategies uh, related to the people uh, directly uh, related to nature? A fabulous question. Thank you so much for this question. Um, to some extent, yes, nature is invisible because we don't give agency also to people who live with nature. At another level, nature is also invisible to us when we are making big plans which, which may not be in sites with tribals or forest dwellers. So, you know, you're making a big industry or a special economic zone. It's not necessary that there are people over there, but we are not able to see or we, we are blind willfully to the dolphins or the tigers or the leopards. But to address the issue of people being invisible, there's a very good legislation in India called the Biodiversity Act of 2002. And it actually has this provision of having people's biodiversity registers in which people who live at the district level in that particular district are supposed to make both oral and written histories of nature and their interaction with nature. So the stuff they eat, the wildlife they see, the plants they grow, the plants in the wild, etc. And it's been very slow implementation of this act, and uh, but it is happening slowly. People are making people's biodiversity registers, and I think it's a great way to begin to actually summarize or to put together an incredible diversity that we have of both oral and different cultures in India, which are very closely linked to nature. And I think it goes, it, it's both things. So even when we are planning a huge project in which we are going to link two rivers artificially together, it will impact people, but it will also drown a tiger reserve, Panna Tiger Reserve, which also lost all its tigers and was also repopulated with tigers. It has incredible gorges where vultures, critically endangered vultures live in. Uh, I think the blindness towards wildlife and nature pervades everything. Uh, so not being able to see people is one, one of those kinds of blindness. The other kind of blindness is just not being able to see wildlife. Whenever we're planning a big project which has multi-thousand crores, we just can't see anything but the money, I think. Great answer. It's a great, great response, Neha. Thank you. Wonderful response. Brings us. Sorry. You have a question for Neha. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you need it has to do with the, what I'm not sure I understood you correctly when you talked about personhood of wildlife. I'm not sure about your question. Are we denying them personhood or should they be considered to be persons, wildlife? And my question for Neha is. Um, Tuskers, elephants are known to trample people to death for various reasons, whether it's their mahouts or uh, yesterday in the newspapers, there was a story about, uh, about Tuskers trampling three people to death, a man, his wife, and his sister-in-law as they lay sleeping in a field of uh, mahua flowers. So how does one reduce instances like that? I'm to sure ask I'm Neha to go to first because it's her evening. So uh, there are many instances of human wildlife conflict in India, not just between elephants and people, but also between herbivores and people. You know, people have also died because um, 
they've been attacked by an antelope like a nil guy or um, uh, predators, both predators like tigers, leopards, and herbivores. So it is an issue. Uh, it is important to acknowledge that living with animals is not a cakewalk and um, that there are losses on both sides of humanity as well as animals, wildlife. At the same time, because it can be so life-threatening, it is important to give it a lot more thought as to how we plan our areas. So normally a tusker or an elephant will not attack people. And if they did, then none of us would be here. Like people like me who walk in the forest would not be here if every elephant was out to uh, kill a person or every animal was out to kill a person. There are lots of dangerous animals in the Indian forests, some of which are very small. So the Russell's viper, the saw scale viper, extremely small snakes, which are extremely venomous. And if they were to attack people every time they saw them, none of us would be here. Having said that, there are drivers of conflict in the landscape. And it's important to understand what are these drivers and why a conflict gets created. Usually conflict gets created because of disturbance. And the thing with elephants is elephants do have migratory or traditional passages that they use. They eat more than 100 kilos of food a day. They need fresh water almost daily. And uh, the landscape is getting cut up by railway lines, as I spoke about, by uh, more soft interventions like tea gardens or coffee gardens which have eaten into the forest, uh, uh, mining, open cast mining. Uh, there are lots of places in Chhattisgarh, in Jharkhand, in Urissa where coal mines have come up in elephant land. And this causes a dislocation. It causes confusion. And it also causes uh, the animal to kind of get disoriented. And it happens in Africa as well with elephants that, you know, if their passages are broken up, they get really confused. And an elephant lives up to 70 years, it's like a person in the sense it has a long memory. And it is important to understand what we are doing to their habitat on a landscape level, not just, you know, in one state, but if the elephant herd is known to use three states or four states, we have to plan in that way and give them safe passages to cross or to climb, you know, wherever we are breaking up their land. And that's why I actually started my presentation with the landscape being invisible to us. You know, in the way that Mihir Vatsa says that Hazari Bag is not seen as a plateau, but as just another city. In the same way, we don't see elephant bearing forests as forests with elephants. We just see them as land, which we are supposed to do something to. As far as Mahua goes, Mahua is an issue because elephants eat Mahua and people also eat or extract Mahua. And there are certain seasons in the year when conflict will be more rampant. And there's also conflict with slot pairs when there's Mahua. And uh, you know all of this requires a kind of intervention at the livelihood level. It is absolutely unacceptable that somebody loses her life because she's collecting Mahua flowers and she comes into conflict with an elephant or a slot pair. And this is where we need to have a kind of synthesis with the local administration because NGOs can't do everything and shouldn't be expected to do everything. But this kind of um, conflict where people actually die because of a couple of leaves or a couple of flowers, a bunch of flowers is absolutely unacceptable. And it requires an intervention at the livelihood level. And you know, if we can uh, kind of do agroforestry or we can do maybe some alternate livelihoods in some places it has worked where people don't have to actually go into the forest and uh, uh, you know basically be completely dependent on a seasonal produce at a particular time of the year where they're coming into conflict with animals and sometimes it also means better storage and processing of that uh, of, of that flower so that they don't have to uh, you know a lot of mahua produce just get just rots every year and so if we can allow the harvest and help them in processing it so that it stays fresh for longer so that you know they can make more from the from what they collect so these are the kind of uh, these are the kind of interventions we may need to do and basically we must understand the problem at the landscape level it's it's, it's hardly ever just something that just happened over there it is usually a landscape level issue and it needs to be seen and tackled as a landscape level issue 
down to the end of this. Uh, uh, we've come to the end of our time this evening, but it's amazing how within the space uh, it, we've explored so many key questions. And uh, Neha, we would really like to thank you for speaking and addressing these issues with such eloquence and also bringing to bear all of the, you know, the substantial empirical work you've done, the field work, and yet to point us towards the affective, towards hope and towards wisdom. And that's really quite a remarkable achievement. I think the way you've bridged inquiry and wisdom is, is uh, really exemplary. And as the closing session of the series, I think give us a great deal to think about as we go out. And also give us a certain resurgence of, of energy, I think. Ravi, you? I'd just like to add that uh, thank you for uh, your very thoughtful and um, uh, your, your deep experience uh, shows through in what you say. So thank you for these words because they come from, uh, I think, uh, thinking very closely from the field uh, how to move ahead with the complexities uh, which we have in many ways chosen to ignore, but we've come to a point where we cannot ignore them, but how to move forward is a, uh, is a great acknowledgement and great uh, thought which you've put to it. So thank you for all these things. We're really grateful to you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Yon, would you like to <laughs> offer some concluding remarks? Neha answered it in great detail and nuance. Yeah, also from the side of Goethe Institute, Max Müller Bhavan, thank you very much for attending this last session of the literary interventions. It was really a pleasure listening to you. Thank you very much. And of course, thanks to Ranjit. <coughs> Sorry, and, and Ravi, um, you uh, have led us um, today together, but also individually through a, a lot of interesting talks, panels. And uh, now that we are at the end of the series, again, a big thanks from the side of the Goethe Institute, Max Miller Bavan, for doing this so passionately and um yeah in, in a way that it also reaches the audiences online and more and more also here at our institute thank you very much thank you so much have a good evening thank you Neha. bye bye and thank you all uh, our audience here and elsewhere